All right. Um, come people in. Um, this session is going to be not 45 minutes. It's going to be 60 minutes of non-stop back and forth of stuff, all the 21 things I've learned doing Drupal. And um, I hope we get time for questions. If we don't, let's take the questions afterwards. Um, if I go over time, I'm sorry. Last time I did this session, it took me two hours to run through, but I also told all the drunken stories from my time in Drupal, so we're not going to do that today. Anyways, this is me, Morton DK. Um, this is actually my name tag. I just created a new company called uh, Theme Machine. Um, so it's not Geek Royale anymore. I still have the same badass logo, so no worries about that. I have stickers with me if anybody wants. Um, so I'm the classic maintainer, which is one of the core Drupal themes, or the core Drupal theme we have right now. That's kind of what I'm doing these days. Um, this is my new company, The Theme Machine, and yes, we have a flying toaster as our logo. Um, if you want to follow the stuff I do, go up to my website, Morton DK. Uh, basically, it's just a bunch of like, usual blog things and stuff around Drupal theming. Um, or use my Twitter account, where, which is like a non-stop moment of truth about Drupal and frontend, and metal, and painting miniature war games, so that's a whole other thing. So, I was born back in 1973. That's the same year as ACDC got started. That's how old I am. Anybody el older than, than this in the room? Oh, good. Yes, there's a, there's a few gray beards in the room. Um, but I'm 42 now, so I have the answer for anything. That's a good thing. This is actually me, like 20 years ago. Yes. As you can see, my, my hair has lost a little bit, but my ego is the same. I do think I'm a fucking rock star. And I even got a clipper on this day, so that's good. This is actually the first time I came on the internet. Netscape 2 just came out. It was in 1996. It was good times. Um, so in 20 years, what have I learned in this web industry? Well, a CMS is really hard to build. Maintaining security is a bitch. It's not easy to make pretty. And I went with Drupal. That was a clever thing, right? Um, actually, 10 years ago, I came into the world of Drupal back at DrupalCon in Brussels 2006. So this is kind of emotional for me to be here after like being in this community for 10 years and having my geek adversary here. So that is a thing I'm happy for. But I learned one thing over the last 10 years, or the number one lesson I figured out by being in this community is that designers and developers are thinking very, very different. Um, and then we have this thing inside of Drupal, which is called the themers, which we do not really know if they're designers or developers. It's kind of this mix max. Um, but that's like the number one thing that I've learned in this community because Drupal is basically built by engineers for developers and then we put the designers on top of that and that is creating some issues because um, you know developers they don't really care about design they care about the front end if it's JavaScript then yeah, I know one of them <laughs> uh, if it's JavaScript then it becomes development then it's going to be exciting design not so much um, no, and nobody seems to understand, on, on, unless you're a themer, that actually the markup in the CSS, no matter how we look at it, is going to be the final product. So that is going to result in this thing that, you know, a world without a theme, how does that look? This is the JavaScript world, the world without a theme. That's how it would look if we didn't have a theme. Actually, this is how it looks without a theme. There's nothing on. Without the theme, no matter what you do as a developer, no matter what you put out, there is nothing. I'm sorry to say. At the same time, we have not been putting the theme or the design as a first thing in the world of Drupal for the first, like, almost 10 years, actually the first nine years, because last year something really good happened. There came this small piece of hope, small little glimmer of hope in a world of darkness without a theme. Drupal Twig. Why is Drupal Twig that? Small little hope we got, well, because we finally begin to separate our front end, our markup, our CSS, and markup and CSS is actually what we paint with, that is our design tool. We finally separated that. Um, it was a long and hard battle, and if you don't like it, I really don't care, and I don't even know that Drupal 7 exists anymore. Um, the thing we can do now from a front end perspective, or from a design perspective, is amazing. Um, so basically this, this talk about 21 things, I learned on that. Um, but the first thing first is like back in Munich in 2012, we had like the very first big discussion how to do this. And there was a one session um, made by Jim Lantern. This is in 2012 when we got the first commit in. Uh, that was called a design-friendly theme system. That is the number one thing we wanted to do with, with the Twig system. It's not doing 
decoupled or anything else, making it a design friendly system so our designers can help the developers looking good. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do in this session is we're gonna unlearn everything. Um, and how, why we're gonna, what are we gonna unlearn? You're gonna unlearn everything you know about Drupal 7, right? Like close your eyes, feel it. Because you remember this? This is Drupal 7. No more. It is gone. It is now completely gone. The days and the Stockholm Syndrome we had of thinking that, you know, Davidus is a feature. The, the idea of 5,000 lines in a PHP template file was totally okay to build it. That the classroom feature, that, you know, that was a feature that we could use. You can just theme on that, also known as trying to smack colors on something you can't even control. All of that, nope. Second thing we're gonna do is you're gonna now understand how a trick works. So this is trick code. The first line is how we do a comment. The second one is how we do a variable. And the third thing is how we're gonna do like functional stuff in it. Done, you now know trick. There's nothing more to it. That's actually the beautiful thing in it. If you're a developer, you're gonna be like, oh shit, these trick files, all these template files, oh no, what am I gonna do with that? Well, relax. They're all compiled into PHP, so this shit is not gonna get more slow. And it's actually a feature, so all of the Twig templates, all of these files, these almost 200 files we have, is gonna be compiled somewhere in that Drupal thingy, which I don't even understand or know about anything anymore. I don't have to, and that's the beauty of it. Um, so, and at the same time, what we have done, um, besides of, let me just get some water. Um, at the same time, what we have done, besides of like, moving all these things out, is we're trying to build in like modern ways of doing stuff. The problem about modern ways, by the way, is always they're gonna get old at some point. Um, the whole way like we're building these things into this like, smack idea, smacks is a way of like organizing your CSS files. Uh, we're putting BEM in, BEM is a way of organizing your class names, your class structure, your CSS, or your CSS structure as it's called. Um, that's like the basic things. Anyways, so how do we build on this? Well, first of all, we have a base theme. That's the first thing you're gonna do. Everything in Drupal has a base theme now. You don't have like anything else than that. You have one of these two themes you're gonna build upon, top upon, and then you're gonna figure out which way you wanna build your theme. Um, so basically in Drupal Core we have stable and we have classy. That's the two themes you're gonna, you're gonna choose between. Um, and then you're gonna have like contrib themes that can be all kinds of different themes you can put in, and then you have your own theme. But Drupal Core comes with two different themes, and there's a reason for that. Um, basically, Stable is a clone of Drupal 8.0. All the markup, all the classes, everything that's in there. So that is a theme that you know exactly what comes out of it. And Stable is the, the minimal version of, of the markup and the classes. Um, the reason we have that, instead of just having Drupal Core, we have Stable is we wanna be able to fix the dumb things we didn't fix before RC1. So all the things we have learned the last year, we can actually now fix because we have Drupal Core over here and we have Stable here and your theme, if you're using Stable, it's gonna be hitting up on Stable so we can fix stuff over here in our core and then later on we can release new version of it. So the stuff we're figuring out that's not working, we can actually release. That was the problem we had back in Drupal 7. Remember that when Drupal 7 just came out and then that yellow book came out, that yellow book that was talking about like responsive sites Anybody remember that, that happy moment five years ago? And then Drupal was standing like the dumb kid in school and we were like, uh, how, do we, how do we make our site responsive? Because we couldn't make Drupal core responsive because then we will break a ton of themes out there. So by having stable as like the protection layer from our own stupidity, all the things we'd never got to fix, um, having that in the middle. And then, uh, um, so basically the idea is to say that right now in 8.0, if you have a, um, a UL tag is gonna have an inline class on it that is hard coded all the way somewhere down in Drupal. Of course, we don't wanna have that. So if we remove that, we clean up the code we never got to do, we can actually do that because you're relying on you know, the stable theme and then we can like walk around that so we can clean that up in like, let's say 8.3 and then your theme is not gonna break. That's, that's basically what, what it is. So stable provides you the bare minimum, just a diff or a section or an article tag and that's it. And then if there's a class it really, really needs, that Drupal really needs, um, then it's gonna be there, else it's gonna not gonna be anything. If you're using the classy theme, that's where we have all the classes and all the names and all that stuff. 
Um, and that's kind of the first choice you take when you do a theme. It's basically, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna be building my site on a, a bare minimum, or I'm gonna build it on like all these standard classes I have? So if you're not, um, you know, really into like reorganizing all your CSS and rethinking, you just wanna like find that class for that field and not make that red, you can totally do that. Just go with Classy. Um, it's pretty much like Drupal 7's class names were, but built up on like a BIM uh, naming. So your theme can actually choose what it wanna do, which way it wanna, wanna go. Um, and don't be false, as we call it, because you can set your base theme to be false. And base theme is false basically means that you can just go, you, you're gonna rely directly on, on core. The problem is when we then fix something in core, we're gonna break your theme. And yes, we will be fixing core. There will be changing on it because you know, the world evolves and Drupal 8 is not gonna be 8.0. It's gonna be 8.2, 8.3, 8.4. We wanna be able to change that. Um, if you want to know more about these like base themes, I created a short little article explaining this stuff and on Drupal.org, there's the same thing as well. By the way, all of my slides here is, I have a short link for it at the very end, so you can download them all, um, and, and so you don't have to like, thanks to write down. Um, so, first, second thing we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about debugging. Um, and basically, in our, in our, we have a service file, we have settings file down in your site's default folder, and these two you, you're actually going to going to work with settings.local um, and your service file. Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to tell it to not use preprocess um, because else, every time you do a CSS change, it's not going to be there. Um, and you are, are going like, to ask for the development of the service YAML file. The reason for that is then we can actually begin um, to have like, a more developer set up, and we can actually ask Twig to debug. And Twig can send out debug info. And that's one of the really little beauties we have in, in Drupal Core, because now when you look into your source code, um, to do a view source as we always do, we're actually gonna get the file names and everything else that Drupal puts out, provides us as a name. Also provides you with the, um, with the, template, the template suggestions and the preprocess, so you get both of these things in there. Um, and we're even gonna tell you where this template is because everything in Drupal 8 is a template file. So there's always a template file somewhere. There is a fuck ton of template files, by the way, and that's just how the feature is. It used to be functions instead that was hidden all over. Now we have template files, and you can actually find them. Um, if you get tired of looking at your markup that way, and that is, can be really, really, really frustrating. Um, if you use Chrome, I guess people are using Chrome, go in and, and look for the Drupal template helper. What it will do, it will actually like hide away all the comments, and then put it into a sidebar in your, in your interface. So you can actually find them easier then. You can copy the files even, even uh, easier. So you get this kind of interface instead. So I can actually find and figure out you know, what template am I using, where's the template living at, and you know, copy the right template name, clone that template, and do that stuff. It's inside of Chrome, and it's pretty goddamn amazing. I can't remember the address for it, but a Drupal template helper is going to push it out. Um, and of course, you know, always you know, get Grush, get Devel. Uh, that's the other module. So, how does this look in normal world? Well, here's the Kint variable. The Kint is Kint is like the debugging tool we're using. So, if I do a Kint content, do a Drust CR. CR is the new, new like Drust CC, and then I reload my page. It's going to print out you know, the data for me, so I can go in, can look at the data, can browse around it, and figure it out. A fair warning, though, there is a lot of data. There's a lot of data that Google puts out. We could have a better tool uh, that would be smaller and more easy, but we don't have yet, um, but up until then, if your site begins to crash because you fire up Kind and do it on a content variable because you have a big piece of content, go into your PHP settings and just crank that fucker up. Uh, I can't remember how much I put into mine, but enough to make my Chrome, Chrome uh, pretty much make my machine go almost down sometimes. We need a better tool for that, but up until then, Kind is the way to go. Um, does it basically give me all the, file, the names I need? Uh, from, from every element. Um, there's another module called Search Kint because there's so much data, so you can actually go in and just search for that. Um, that's another good little tool to have, have with you in your toolbox. Um, good. So, third thing that I came around, came to figure out was like these template suggestions. So, everything is a template, and Drupal provides template suggestions in all kinds of ways. And that is kind of the hook and how you're going to work with this. Um, so, in Classy, if you go into Classy and you go into templates, then you're going to have like another this way of organizing your templates, so block content, content edit, data sets, and so forth. They're all organized in groups because there's about 140 templates to look at, so we're trying to like put them into like different basic group sets. Um, 
and, and this is for my for a field at a certain point. Like these are all the like, different suggestions I've put into it. So now I can begin to be very specific of where it lives. The, the, um, the thing on this, like you can actually, you don't have to put your templates in a specific way. You can put them wherever you want inside of your templates folder. Um, so you can actually begin to group your stuff. So if you saw Lowry's talk early on where he began to talk about, you know, you group your thing, you have your card, and then you have your card CSS files, and I kind of move everything into a little block of that way. You can actually do that now. Um, and that's the way I used to, uh, I like to work because it gives me an easier way to find my stuff later on. I don't care if it's a block or what it is. I'm more care of what, what it is. So if, I, if I'm working on a search field, I have the block around the search field, the search field, and the CSS file for the search field, all of that into one folder. You just put it down there. Um, and like this is like a component for, for actually my, I think this is for the, yes, that is for my own. No, it's a test theme, sorry. Um, anyways, um, the idea here is to, as you can see, if you know anything about Smacks, I'm pretty much building them up the same way because now I have the same terminology in everything I do. Um, so I use the same like way of thinking. So everything, like, I have uh, my, all my base elements, I have some admin elements, I have like base components, I have my layouts, and like, trying to organize stuff in a way so it makes sense for me to work with, not so much for a machine because we can move them around. One thing though that you need to understand when you do this, that Drupal doesn't care about the path where stuff lives in. It looks only for the template name, which means that it's a very good idea to use very specific template names for your stuff when you begin to group in this way. Because um, in this case, let's say I have on my templates, I had my set uh, component versus my A component, and my set component wanted to be the one that should take on the node HTML, the twig file. Well, Drupal doesn't care about that. It just reads from the, from the root and just down, so it actually goes alphabetical. So to do that, be more specific in your templates. Be very sure of when you're naming what. And yes, you can use very, very long template names. Unless you're running on a Microsoft something something server, but if you're doing that, you have another set of problems, um, basically. Another thing is, which I learned a few days ago, is you can only nest four folders down. If you go more than that, then Drupal can't find the file. That only cost me an hour and a half of my sanity and like, restarting my server and trying to debug in all kinds of ways until, until I just tried to move the file out of that last folder. Um, because you're gonna have a lot of file names. The system I'm working with now is having three dashes to separate each part of it, and then two, two da dashes to separate the name and the value. So it kind of like creates this system of like naming stuff, um, which means you get like these absurd long file names, but it still makes it easy for you to find them. Um, the thing, the way you can like put all these uh, theme suggestions in, if you go into your dot theme folder, the dot theme file, which is the same thing as PHP template file used to be, if you go into that and go to the hook theme suggestion and then the hook for it and alter, that is where you can like fix all of these names. So you don't use the pre process for this, you use your, your theme suggestion instead and that's gonna, be, gonna become a tool that the more deeper you get into Drupal, that's actually where you're gonna put a lot of things because it's all based on files. Um, and yeah, as, as I said, you can get very, very long names. Um, but now, on this one, I actually, you know, I know it's a, it's a field, it's in my node, it's the bundle article, the view mode is the full view mode, and the type is text long. And that's how I, I, I really like to have that level of control. Oh, thank you. Ah, God fucking damn it, Chrome. Sorry, no, it's not sorry for the swearing. I'm an island, they can take it. <laughs> All right, so. Um, Let's say I'm building like this one element. This is my, uh, I built this like code, uh, code preview thing uh, for my site so I could share you know, code elements. So in that folder, I would have like field paragraph, bundle code, type string, name, field code, field file name, and so forth. So everything I do here is I'm just trying to put them all into one folder so I can move them around and can figure out where it is. Um, and that's become a very simple way of actually organizing your files. If you just put them all in one folder and drop it down, you're gonna, at some point you're gonna sink in, because not all of our file names are actually that good, because some of the file names are just, a lot of them is just translated directly from the function name they used to have in Drupal 7, which can have some funky names around. So organize your stuff in folders, do it that way, that's actually gonna make sense for you. So fields, that's like the building blocks we have in Drupal, and a field, built the same way as it did in Drupal 7. You have HTML, you have the page, around the page, then you have like regions you can put in, which I hope to remove someday because I don't understand why we even have these. And that besides of the regions, inside of that region, then you can have like a view or a node or a block thingy. And inside of that, that's where you have your fields. 
Um, and these fields is, of course, also based. You have the basic field template and so, and that can then be named based on the type and so forth. Um, so you would have field image, field text, field foo, field whatever. That's kind of all of the different fields and how you organize your fields. Um, and one of the other things on these fields is they also use the same like name basing. So if you have a field dash image, that's the only field dash image you have. Well, all of your different like notes and content types will use the same field. And that's just like being, remember that it does this because then you're not gonna, not gonna break stuff later on. Um, so the field markup used to be actually the thing that created our debates. Because uh, you will, nobody really were looking back in the days of how a field should be themed. It was just how do we create the same markup for everything. Um, so we looked into that. It actually took us about two years to figure out why it was that way. Because nobody was really playing around with it. Um, so a field is basically a label and a value. That's what's there and a wrapper. If we look at that, then we have, you know, we have a single field. We have a single field with a label. We have multiple values for the single field with no label and multiple values with a label. That's the four different variations we have of a field. We don't care what kind of data comes out of this field. It could be an image, it could be a content, it could be a node, it could be you know, a title tag. It doesn't really matter. Um, so looking at that and having four different ways of it, we looked into the template and figured out, okay, we need we don't need the same markup for everything. If there's only one value and no label, why do I have like all kinds of wrapper elements around it? I mean, the markup should reflect the kind of data that comes out of it. It should not just be one big plug of it. That's kind of the engineering brain that want to have that, like everything should be the same. And that was what created our debates, um, which made people like me very frustrated. Um, oh, and on the same time, same time, we also have you know, managed displays on top of it. So we have a lot of things going on in this file. Um, Plus, you know, we have inline and above and visual hidden for these fields, um, which, you know, creates yet another issue, um, which makes the field template look big and scary. Um, but if you look at it this way instead, what we're doing is we're saying, if this label is hidden, well, then we're going to test if there's multiple or single field. If there's no label, we're going to test if there's a multiple or single field. So now we have the four instances of what our, in our field, what what we're gonna do on every field. Um, and then we can begin to work with that and just do the if else. You can even remove all of these things if you know there's one field that's just a single field, never gonna be changed, you can remove that. Don't do that on your fields template, do that on the specific field where you know you're never gonna have multiple elements. Um, because then you can begin to build you know, the markup that makes sense. So it just says, yo, you're just gonna have a diff wrap around it or whatever you wanna have it. If there's multiple, maybe you're gonna have a section. If you're gonna have a section, then you're also gonna have the name for it that should be you know, an H tag instead of another diff. So you can begin to give your markup, you can give it the script to markup that it should have. Um, and on the same time, then we also have the attributes. I'm gonna come with them soon because next thing here is the loops. And loops is, is kinda like how, every time you have a piece of data, especially in the field, that's a loop. And that loop is very easy to use. You just taste on it, you go for item and items, and then you can test on each of these elements. So you can say if it's first or it's the last, or if it's number two or number four, that's the loop.index. That's how we can taste on it. You can also go in and taste on the values for it. So every time we have a piece of data, we can do that. So first loop, you know, last loop, da, 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 index. Um, and we can even go the, the opposite way. So if you know your data is gonna be done in a specific way, we can work around that. So as a little dumb example of that, um, and of course, the very last thing of it, remember with the default, else you know, data is not gonna be printed out. Um, so that's like the control for it. So here's a short little example of that, how, what you can do with that. So this was for last year's, um, for a demo I did last year. And, and what, is, what I'm doing here is I'm basically testing on these things, figuring out you know, if an index is, a, you know, if, it's, if it's number eight for it, you will print this data out, but we're actually not only gonna print the data out, we're actually gonna change the complete markup for this um, and just making it the way we want to instead of having, like, having to add in CSS to override whatever we're thinking, we wanna have it to like, print out the thing you actually want. So if this is gonna be the, the eighth piece of data, then we're gonna answer about when you know, Jubilee is gonna come out. Mm. And I can put my whatever markup I want to have into it. And that's another beauty when you, when you look at a Twig template. It's basically, it's, it's just HTML. 
it's really, really easy to use. It's really simple to use. You don't need to be trained in it. You kind of just open up the file, and if you understand an index, a loop, if you understand that concept, you have an array of data in a loop, and then you can like dot into it, then you're pretty much set for it. Um, so less templates, because in Drupal, we also have 135 at least templates, and that's out of the box, not compared to what you put in. Another way of getting around this is you can actually go in and say content.fieldname.0, and then print out the markup. So if you have a template and you don't want to call another template to get that data in, that's a way you can get that data off. Sometimes you really want to, want to have that. Let's say you have a field name that has a value and you want to use that value for, uh, for a class name or a variation over a class name or something like that. And you don't want to load in another template just to get that data up, then just go with the dot field name dot zero dot markup. Markup is the same data that comes out. Um, so if you want to, this, this thing, this example here, what I wanted to do was uh, I want to grab the, the code language and figure out what that is so I can use that as my class. So I can say, you know, um, language dash uh, YAML or language dash JSS or whatever it can be. Um, so I can get this kind of markup out uh, instead of having to like try to guess my way in and do that. Um, so Drupal selectors. The selectors for CSS is, I think, pretty much the killer feature compared to Drupal 8. Um, when we, compared to Drupal 7, when we're creating our templates and when we're creating our markup, we also want to have complete control over the class names we have because we don't want to have Drupal to decide over our classes. What we want to have instead is we want to give suggestions but give you the chance to actually be able to modify them. So in this example, this is for the note template. I have note, I have note dash dash type, and then I have the name for the bundle. I test on if it's promoted, if it's sticky, if it's published, what kind of view mode is, is. and then I put in the, the class names that I need. So when you open up this template the first time and figure out, you know what, I don't want to have it to be called node dash dash type because that's not how we're writing our CSS. You can actually change your CSS with the way you write CSS completely. Just go through each template file and change it as you want to. Um, and basically what you do is you're doing a set Set foo, and that's kind of how, that's how you create a variable. So set foo, Drupal 8, that would be like foo is the best, that is Drupal 8 is the best, that, that's how you do that. So, um, and, <sighs> sorry, oh, speaking a lot. Um, so in this, in this case here, what I'm doing is I'm taking the note, I'm doing a uh, variation over and say note, dash, dash, and type, and then the bundle instead. So you can just change it as you want to. The way you like add these, Strings are just using the tilde, and then they're going to get that out. That's how we're going to work on it. You can also put questions into it and say, you know, something, something, something. Is this promoted? Use the class promoted or no promo. Um, you can change the class names to whatever you want to. And here's one thing, though. Now we have this, like, we have this control over our template, our class names. Stop putting class names in to your preprocessors. You don't want to have them living there. You want to put a variable in so your templates can actually work with them. The whole idea of doing this in preprocess is a strange Drupalism, and that's how we used to do it in Drupal 7. Unfortunately, we're still seeing that, and that's kind of, kind of sad, so stop doing that. I'm going to show you an example later on why that is an issue. So if you want to have, give the template a variable because you want to have that variable to be able to do something with the class, well, create a variables, and then the template you want to have put in or the class name you want to put in and then you can print that variable out on the template and then that template can then do whatever it with with it because you don't want to force your themers or your front end or your CSS architecture to be built in a certain way. You want to make this modular, right? I mean, we want to do it right. So attributes. Attributes is where um, that's kind of the next thing we can like modify in the way do all the classes and we can make some, some good things. Um, Basically, Drupal 7 did to put in all the classes, and then you had a preprocess or a template file or a theme function, and you kind of like put all that out. Drupal 8, what it's doing instead is like, Drupal 8 puts out a fuck ton of variables. All of these variables, we can then do something with, actually put it into Classy, inside the Classy template, we're then gonna put it out. So the control of classes is now built into our theme layer. So if I wanna add a class at some point, you know, I do set my class and I do a variable that creates that, and then I do my attributes, and then I do add class, and then I can put in the classes. And this, this way I can now control and, and create my class. I can also remove elements. And you see the pipe, the field name pipe, and then clean class. Clean class is how we're making sure that the CSS name is gonna be correct, so no spaces um, and, and so forth. 
and that's just how, we, how you pipe your data all the time. So when you create a class name, if you have a variable, just pipe that stuff. That's, that's how you're going to do that. If you want to remove a class, you can do that as well. Why do you want to remove a class? Well, let's say that I have this site, and somebody installed the module Bad Canadian. Bad Canadian put one class in that's called Nickelback. I don't want to have Nickelback class messing in my theme because I might have another class that, you know, if somebody put Nickelback class in, I'm going to do a display none on all the data. So it's going to break something. So we, don't, we want to remove Nickelback. Basically how it's done is like core provides classes, a module can provide classes with the attributes, uh, do an add class, and then I have classy that could do the same. Well, I can also do the attribute.remove and then that class name. So if I do attributes that remove Nickelback, Nickelback is gone. Um, and that way I can I remove all the classes I don't want so it doesn't mess. So a module that puts classes out I don't need, I can remove that. I can even do it better. I can actually say if I have a class, then I can even put another class in. Um, so remove Nickelback, done. If you're going to use JavaScript for anything and you need class names for it, pretty please, make sure you prefix that stuff with JS dash and then the name. If you then want to do put colors and stuff of it, then use the same name but without the JS prefixing, because else there's no way in hell we can figure out later on what's going to happen. In my, one of my old themes, the mothership, what happened was I broke views Ajax browsing for almost six months because I cleaned up the class names. We don't want to have that kind of thing. That was fun bug reports to get in and trying to figure out why that wasn't, wasn't working. Um, yeah, clean class we talked about. So attributes, I have my niggle back. You can even... You can do a remove class, you can do add class, you can do even set an attribute, and yes, I know, I did an ID here with the top on. All of this stuff, if you do that into your template, it's gonna give you, you know, a diff with an ID of top and a class of rush. Um, and that's the control you get on this, so you can modify the attributes, that's powerful stuff. So, with that known, I can now begin to pimp stuff in a whole new way. So let's say I have my search field. I'm gonna remove these classes, I'm gonna remove this attribute, I'm gonna set attributes to auto save and get the last 10 results, auto complete is gonna be on, auto focus is gonna be on, and I'm gonna put a placeholder in on it, and that placeholder is gonna be seek and destroy. That's how it looks. That you can do directly out of Drupal now without having to like work for four weeks to figure this shit up. Um, so, and that's just, this is a thing, feature that's built into uh, the latest Safari browser. So when I, when I search for stuff, I can actually get all the last, last versions of whatever I search for. It's not inside of Chrome yet, but these are like, these are the, this is the power we have given the theme now, and personally, I enjoy that a lot. Um, you can even go, go the cowboy way. So let's say you're gonna, you know, sometimes shit is gonna be dumb. This is me in Texas, by the way. Um, you know, you're gonna do something cowboys, like you need a class when the node ID is 158, because the client demanded, you know, hot rocking cowboy thingy, when you had a node ID that way. We can do this in a lot, lot of dumb ways. Um, the way to do that proper is, you know, you can actually do a pre-process, then taste on the node. If it's a node, then you provide the variable for it, you put that ID in, then you taste on that, says if the node ID, the ID here, is 158, well, add in the hot rocking cowboy. Um, so you can do that every time, and also not put it in. That would be like a way of how to modify some of these cowboy tricks that we all know we should not do, but we also know we are gonna do them at some point. Always do that in a way where you, take, you give a variable to your template, put that template out, so you can actually figure out later on what goes on. Um, libraries is kind of the next thing. Libraries is where we define CSS and JavaScript files. Um, you don't call them in other ways. That also means that a, a template file can define a library so we can begin to call them in. Um, and libraries is based in your info file where you kind of, this is my vanilla, I define a library called global, and then that global library is then gonna be used. The reason for that is that now I can create different libraries, and this is the same way a module does it. So let's say that I wanna create my slider, then I can create a slider library and put that in. Um, let's see here, so this is how a library is defined. Um, and on the first line, let's see here, yep, sorry for that. Um, as you can see on it, uh, you have like CSS, you have a global name for it, CSS base, then you have uh, every, uh, everybody knows Smacks in here, by the way? You know what Smacks is? Oh, sh okay, not that many. We need to school you guys, because Smacks is powerful stuff. Smacks is a, a methodology of how to modify, um, how to organize your CSS files. 
Um, and what I'm doing here is on my base, that is like the most like base is like forms and input fields and that kind of thing. That's where you put, put that in. Then you have layouts, you group all your layouts files. Then you have components where you group all of your different components, your search fields and so forth. Then you have state, which could be like my menu is active or not active. And then you have theme, which is actually where you put in all of your like, uh, your colors and stuff. So that's a, that's a methodology to organize your CSS file and it's one of the methodologies that we use in Drupal Core. Um, the good thing is that I know there's a conference coming up in Athens at some point where actually the dude who wrote Smacks and created this whole mythology is actually gonna be there, that's gonna be exciting. Um, that dude, so when you look and when you define one field, what you, or one file, what you can do is you can go with this, this is my base full CSS and you give, even give it a weight so you can like move it up and down the chain, figure out where you're gonna put it. Um, if you wanna have an external element, you can do that as well. You just call it and say this, is, this type is external. If it's specific like media acquire, you can do that as well. So say you have your print style sheet, put that in, then Drupal's gonna take care of the rest. Um, you can even defend, uh, Dependencies, for example, for jQuery, the good thing about that is if you don't want to have these uh, 82 kilos of love in your theme because you don't use jQuery, you just don't define it, and then it's not going to be used. So we have removed all these elements. Um, you can also remove libraries, and you can, um, you can overwrite libraries. So each library is kind of connected. You can connect them to a file as well, and then you can work, work that way around. So that's the way you modify your stuff. You don't just yank a CSS file in. You connect it to a library, and then you call it. Um, you have specific style sheets you want to remove. You can do that as well with the style sheet removed inside of your info file. The problem with that is kind of that it's deprecated. Uh, it's kind of a, a fix around, uh, but sometimes it can be nice to have that hammer to just like remove this CSS file now. Um, <sighs> even better with these libraries, as soon as you understand, you know, oh, a library is a bunch of CSS and JavaScript files. Well, what if I only want to li I will load in my library as long as I have a specific um, file. I don't want to load on all of my CSS all the time. What I want to do is I actually want to, I want to load in the CSS when I need that. So if I don't, if not loaded in my node template yet, why am I loading in all of my CSS? It doesn't make sense. So in this example, this is back to my code widgets. I have my code.css, I have prism.js and prism.css. Then I can, I can use that and then call it in as, as a widget. So you have the, the trick command, the attached library, and then use the active theme name, because then when you move it further around, later on it's gonna use the theme you're in, and then call in that library. And in that way, you're separating now, you have your template files, you have your library, and then you have your CSS and JavaScript files, and these, they are gonna move around. So you're only gonna call in your stuff as you need it. Um, and in that way, I can create this code snippet library, and you, as you can see, put in the things when I need them, so they're not gonna be called around all the time. Attached library is a wonderful thing. <sighs> SVG and inline files, Whew, 14 and 22 minutes to go. <sighs> is it too fast, by the way? Yes, People are like, <laughs> <laughs> I know we can, you can like download the video later on and we can like put it on slow. <laughs> but okay, so the next thing you can do, SVG files. SVGs to me is the sexiest stuff that comes out in many, 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 many years. And what you can do, you can now directly with Squick, you can inline your SVG files directly without doing anything. You don't have to copy the file and paste the code. You just take the SVG file, save it to your theme, and then inside of that theme you do include, and then themes slash your theme name slash whatever, whatever it is, and then the, the SVG file. And that means that this is now gonna be included directly inside of your, inside of your theme and just prints this stuff out for me. And I know, yes, I've not cleaned my SVG files up because I'm lazy, but that also means I can just open up afterwards and actually edit in it. And as a graphic nerd, that is wonderful. Um, whew, I need to open up another water. Just a second. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about here is a Twig block, and that is not just a block. It is a Twig block because we, in the world of Twig, there's a thing called a block, and we were, that kind of joking about it, that we should actually rename Drupal's block so we had the same namespacing as they have in the world of Twig. We also figured out that will take us six years in the issue queue and we will never get it done. So a Twig block is a block inside of Twig. It is not a Drupal block. Make sense? Nah, eh, kind of. Eh. So the idea behind a block is you can take a part of your, your, pay, of your template and inject another template in there. So let's say you have your page template where it's all of your overall markup is, 
And then on the front page, you want to like add in a new element. You want to add in a specific banner or a welcome to my home page. Yes, I've been in this industry for 20 years and I remember when it was called the home page and you said welcome on your front page. Kind of like what Drupal does. Welcome to Drupal, you have no content. Um, in this example, what I want to do is I want to put in you know, a Drupal hero thingy when that is there. Um, so my page template, I'm going to define this block and then the name of it and then say end block. Now I have a place where I can inject other templates. And then Drupal uses the template suggestions and as you remember early on how we could completely control the template suggestions, then you're going to take a template suggestion and you can use that template. Uh, so what I'm doing in this, the page dash dash front, I'm first telling it, you know what, I'm extending on this template over here. So instead of Drupal loading the whole page dash dash front HTML that tweak as it should do normally, now it instead says, oh, I'm gonna use the existing page template, but then I'm gonna inject this little part of it. So I can put the, the Drupal 8 hero markup directly inside of this template. So I have a template here, call that template name, or like on the front page, and then I can inject another template into it. And you can do that with all the templates, which means that you can now have only one template to have all of your markup structure in, and then modify on that. Um, that can also turn into a logistical nightmare if you don't really think about it. Um, but, and that's why you really want to make sure that you organize your templates because you have going to have that many templates. I can see one guy nodding in his head and he's probably ended up in the hole. I'm going to do my fields and I'm going to rename all of my fields and I cannot figure out where my markup come from. Twig has not only enough rope to hang you with, it will do it with a big pleasure if you don't think a little bit about what you're doing. Um, hmm. So, here's an example for it. So my, um, this is my front Front page message. Welcome to my home page. I was feeling old school that day. Um, and here's my, my site. Just so you can see, I'm not lying. And yes, this was back in the demo days um, where Drupal 8 wasn't really out yet and things were breaking a lot. Um, but in that way, you can change these little pieces of how Drupal works. You can change your template as you need it. Pretty sweet. Um, so. Ten years ago, the first site I built in Drupal were a site for the Danish Metal Awards. It's a Metal Awards show for, because I'm a metalhead. So I built this site for them. I was using Drupal for it. And the first thing, ten years ago, we didn't have this fancy CSS image swapping thing. We used straight up JavaScript and GIF files to swap those stuff back and forth. You remember those days? Wonderful, right? It was like simple and good. Doing that in Drupal, would the only way of controlling this and putting so files in the right places uh, and reorganizing the menu would require me to do regular expressions. When you begin to set the designer and the themers to do regular expressions, you know the system is wrong. And maybe back then I should have been thinking a little bit and actually left, left Drupal at that point, but I got caught up in the whole community field and people were all hating on Drupal at DrupalCons because you can't find another place in the world where we bitch and moan so much about Drupal, which I also think is very refreshing. Um, so, coming up with Drupal 8, I began to play around with how can I, what, can I actually do this the right way? Can I even put in SVG files into my menu as I need them? So, on my own site, I began to experiment with this. The problem around SVG files is, you know, there's, like, there's issues around it, but let's see what it is that I want to do. Um, so, what I'm doing here is I'm creating, I'm using the existing fields that is inside of the this, this site, and instead of like creating a new field and a menu field and doing configuration for that, what I'm doing is I'm actually using a pipe to have data I can then like separate up. So I add in the title and then I said, you know what, use this ID, which is this place is gonna be rocket, use that and then use that as a name inside of an SVG inline file. Um, SVG inline is kind of the same way as a, a good old, uh, you know, kind of an, uh, what's it called, a sprite just with SVG files instead. So. Um, let's see here. What, what it's doing here, it is you know, putting in these things. Let's see here. Ding, 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 ding. So here's my link. And as you can see, I have my SVG inlines. It's using an X link, which is then only using one template. Not one template, sorry, one SVG file. So I can have all of my icons over there. And they're then defined by the ID um, inside of it. Let's see here. So the thing is, Here's another thing about Drupal. When you work with the menu, this is actually a whole lesson itself. 
Drupal menu is, is not the is active class, it gets injected somewhere by JavaScript. I do not know why, it took me like half a day to figure out that was how it was done. So is active is just a class that gets set in there. I'm pretty sure that Vim Deers can explain to us why, but that's how it is. So I want to be able to oh, add that in, I want to be able to like, move around as, as Drupal does at markup, not just rewrite it all. Um, and then I'm gonna add in your know, SVG inline and do it with the use. And then having like poor CSS tooltips, which is using the attributes. So you can actually use CSS to read tooltips directly. Um, and that means that now I have my main menu, I have my one, two different templates, I have a CSS file, a little bit of JavaScript, and you know, menu icons. That's everything for my, for it. And this is my, my icons and my sketch file. And then named the right way, you know, as you can see on the side, you all have, you have site, speaker, webcam, target, eye, rocket, Pantone, code, and camera. These are my icons I'm gonna use. And this is how the SVG file looks. You have all the IDs for it, and then I can like reference them. So, I know how to do this in markup. How do we do that in Drupal? Well, first of all, I, make, I, I misuse the, um, the existing field, the description, and I use a pipe to separate that data up, instead of creating a new field, because I don't have time to create a field and figure out how put, to put that into the menu. Sometimes you just wanna get stuff done. Um, Let's see here. Using that icon name, that icon name is then gonna reference down into the menu. Um, and this is kind of pretty, uh, I would say, edgy stuff because a lot of browsers doesn't understand them anymore, but this is also the way, like, can I actually change this stuff in the menu as I want to or can't I? I put my rocket in when I want it. So I take the description string, I split, split it, I take the ID, I call it in my SVG files, I create my markup, I sneak that into Twig, and I do that with an inline template and to get that out. The reason for the inline template is gonna to come to in a second. So, these are all the steps I go through. The first line up there, set description, take item, original title, dot get description, split that, take my pipe, and then create my link title and my SVG icon. So now I can begin to work with my data as I want to. No preprocess, no nothing. All of this stuff is done inside of a Twig file. When I begin to do this, I begin to feel pretty fucking badass. Let me just put it that way, because I was like, holy shit, I can actually modify my data exactly as I want to, and it just spits it out. Um, and the inline template, so the reason for the inline template, this is where it gets really complicated, is, so Drupal, by default, is, um, is not allowing SVG files. The reason it's not allowing SVG files to be uploaded directly is that security kind of thing. So me as a designer is now hitting into the, to the whole way of like security, and I'm like, I just want to create my menu as I want to create my menu instead of going the other way around. Um, so yeah, link title, splitting that up, up, getting the icon name in. Here's my markup that I want to print out. Here's the, is it actually dying on me? My SVG where I use use instead of separate SVG files. And then I'm doing my inline template. The inline template is some sneaky shit. You're creating a template that Drupal thinks is a template file, but it's actually not. So in that way, um, Drupal is not able to understand that I'm putting an SVG file in. So it's just gonna print it out. Um, and that is how I came around and smacked the security guys around, which of course caused a big drama and I was called out for it to be like an evil, evil human being. Um, at the same time, I'm, doing, I'm creating the link. So if you see here, I got do set menu link, put in my template. So the link command, doing menu link, and render that stuff, I have the item URL, and then I put in a class and a data balloon and a data balloon position. That's for a, a little CSS um, script called balloon, which creates like little balloons. Um, I would prefer just to set, set a variable and it says use this markup and use my SVG file this way, and then do link, vary, link, and then take this variable and do a render on it, and then add in like the item URL. But you know, these guys, Drupal security guys, do take security very serious, which we do need to have. The problem is that if we can't define an SVG file directly, we're gonna do tricks like this instead, because there's no way in hell that Drupal should decide of what kind of markup that I'm gonna put in. Um, so, layouts. This is, this is a, another good thing. So, you have the content variable inside of your node. Content, then pipe and without. That gives you control over each field, so you can print out all the content and remove separate fields for it. Um, and that's the, other, the, the, the pipe. You have a trick function that's without, then you have the field name. So inside of a node, let's say you have content, you wanna have images and tags out on the side, how are you gonna do that now? Well, 
basically, if you just print out content, you're going to have it all into, into one box. That's not what we want to do. We want to move it out. So I do content without image. Now my content will not print out the image. Then I can do content.image and print out whatever I want to in my template file. And the same thing with my tags. I can do that as well. So the good thing about that is at some point, you know, you're going to add in a new field to your note. You can then work around that. It's just going to be printed into the content unless you're going to do another without and print that out. And it doesn't matter where you're going to put that on your template. You're just going to yank that in. So you can put in new fields. You can separate your stuff up and move that around that way. Here's an example for that. Mm. Another little trick, tr trick, 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 not trick, trick, damn it. Language is hard, is how I'm like removing stuff out of Drupal that I don't think should be there, or you know, I know there's something I always want to override. Don't put that in a separate folder. I have my underscore remove, so stuff I actually want to see removed, I put in there. So if I have you know, um, the region template, the region template I don't use, I don't use that wrapper that's there. So I have my, I have to find my template, I put it in there, and then I know where it's at. So yes, there's the region. And the region is basically just cleaned out, it doesn't have anything in it, and I put my template in there so I can actually find it later on, because again, 135 templates at least, plus whatever you put on top of it, it's gonna make you sync to it, my cleanup folders. Filters and auto escape. Um, so, when we have a variable in Twig, we can do all kinds of fancy things with it. Basically, we have all of the PHP functions that you can call. You can use them as a filter. Um, the, one of the things is, back to security, is we have a high level of auto-escape. We can't just push stuff out. Last year, we, got, we didn't get Drupal 8 out, actually, at DrupalCon because of Twig and auto-escape. I'm kind of almost sorry for that. Um, so in this case, what I was playing around with, like, you know, I want to do uppercase on something. Um, and I know I could do uppercase with CSS instead. So the CSS nerds, yes, I know. But this is just for the example of it. So what I wanted to do is I want to create everything into uppercase because I like uppercase and sometimes it just looks cool. So I'm doing this. So here's my variable, here's my data. Um, how do I do that? Well, you know, I do, you know, I do item.content pipe upper. Upper is the uppercase thing. Well, that doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Oh, because of something. I, don't, I never even understood why it wasn't working. But there's something around filters here, so this is one of the things I learned. So I learned to take item.content and instead get in, grab the text, and do an upper. Then it does this, because everything is auto escaped. Then I get a little bit cranky. I'm like, shit, do I need to like pre process data and move it out? And how do I do this? Okay, I'm gonna do upper, and then I'm gonna do strip tags. Okay, fine. Yes. Now I got all the, like, you know, I've got all this, the spaces and the returns. Like, God fucking damn it, Drupal. Well, here's a cool thing. You can also do a replace. So I gotta do, take my data, upper, strip tracks, and replace these parts of the markup, or part of the data that comes out, and replace it with something else, all inside of my template, so now I can do this. Yes. Um, so it's just to remember that when you're using filters, it's not always they're actually using because we have auto escape, and auto escape is actually very important, so we don't end up with all kinds of security things. And even that we are designers or front-end developers, we should actually like, help out of our developers with not doing cross-site scripting and all this like insecure crap that make black hats go in and you know, screw over our Drupal sites. We don't want to have that. So, but finding ways to work around it this is kind of the, maybe a little bit of an extreme example, but it was also fun to figure out that I could actually do this. Like I can do replace, I can, I, I can chain filters, I can do all these things. Because um, well, we need security, we need that thing to be built in, and it should be built in by default, even that I yell at them sometimes. And I'm still angry that we don't have, have proper SVG inline elements inside of Drupal yet, and we should find a solution for it. Um, so, the 20 of things I learned by accident was the screenshots. So you know you have a screenshot of how your site looks. But I figured out what you can do, because we have the whole file name now. It's not just called screenshot. You can actually put a GIF file in. So what I can do now is I can make epic screenshots, right? I do think that is pretty sweet. Um, that do opens up the door for us to be able to like, like make like little GIF animations of how the theme looks and different responsive modes and so forth. So it's just like one of those little things. And here's the 21st, 21, 20, 20, 
whatever, 21st, 21st, yes, 21st thing I learned. And this is many years ago. I'm out on a shooting range in Denver with WebChick. Um, this is WebChick with a machine gun. That's not scary at all. And what I did back then was every time I got the chance to talk with like the core developers, I was trying to figure out why the fuck they were putting the bitches on us. Why I did not learn or understand all the needs we had as markup and CSS nerds. And she told me that, well, you know what? Nobody told us what to do. Nobody told the developers back in Drupal 4.7 what we wanted for the front-end perspective. Nobody told that, and because we know that we're not even thinking in the same world, you know, the, the, the right brain versus the left brain, nobody told us what to do. That was her answer, and she actually had a shotgun in her hand at that point. It was kind of like, sorry, ma'am, but <laughs> we were gonna tell you. So that's actually a thing that we have been come better at as front-enders or designers in the world of Drupal is telling the development community what we need, because if we don't, tell them, if we don't describe it, if we don't figure out what's actually the issue, we're never gonna get these things done. It's just gonna be bad. Because how, how can you create something you don't even know what we want? And if we then came in, come in after that, and it's, it's, it's like actually acting a little bit like spoiled brats, because you know all these developers have been using so many years of building Drupal, and then we begin to bitch and moan about stuff is not exactly the way we want, that's not fair. So, we need to be vocal and we need to help out our developers to build a better system so we can make it pretty and build the things that we need. So we don't end up with that JSON file as to what Drupal puts out. Because um, you know, designers are a little bit different than developers. It's just how it is. Um, but I really, well, if we can actually sit down and figure stuff out, we can actually make stuff really powerful. And we can actually build the system that we all hopefully want and create this superhero thing. So we kind of need to help these guys because, hey, we look like this, right? Because um, there's three different ways, three different things we have to do. We have design, and inside of the world of design, we work in Sketch and Photoshop and you know, pencils and that kind of thing. Then we have the theme. The theme is CSS, HTML, and, C and, and JavaScript stuff. Then we have like PHP and JavaScript and Node and whatever those code guys are doing. And basically, over in the design, we have the issue of like, Make the logo bigger. In the theme, we have like the whole browser held trying to get that stuff done. And then we have all the code world just making it work. Of course, then we also have the third part I've not talked about this time, that's the DevOps guys. But the only reason they are here is just to say no to us. <laughs> but because communication is hard. It is hard to get this stuff done. I mean, if it was not hard, we would not be doing it, right? I mean, that's how I look at it. If it was easy, I mean, anybody could do it. And that's kind of like, you know, DrupalCon is kind of the elite. Um, I should do that. So, whew, I got two minutes and 36 seconds left. One last thing. Um, you probably have seen that, um, well, I've created a new company called Theme Machine, and I created a theme called Flat Earth. I put out this Monday, I put out pre-release for it, because I want to begin to build Drupal premium themes. So, smaller shops or shops who want to have something that doesn't look like seven can actually work with that. Um, and yes, it, my logo is a toaster. It's completely right. Uh, so what I figured out was, like, here's, here's how it looks right now. It's very much in pre-release, trying to like, rethink how an admin theme could look. This is from a park in, in Berlin last week. Uh, you know, having managed fields not looking like something that's built for a bunch of nerds, having something that actually looks like something that would make you happy to work with, make me happy when I touch it. So what I've done, I put, out, I put it out as a pre-release this week. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm doing a free demo of it so you can go and you can download it tinyurlcom flat earth demo. I hope for some of you guys to like, throw some money at me. Like, you can also do a buy the version, but I also just want to get it out uh, right now. So in about a month when I have the final release, it is going to be a version where it's only going to be paid support and because we can't design these things if we don't have any kind of money for it. So, but up until then, go in, download it, this is it's gonna put you over to a site called Gumroad, which is kind of a paid service kind of thing. It's all free for you to download. You do have to put in your, like your name so I can spam you forever, sell your, your addresses to you know, WordPress guys and that kind of thing. But basically, basically just like take it, download it, play around with it, tell me what you feel about how you link, what, what's the idea for it. Let's begin to rethink how we actually are looking into Drupal and Drupal 7 or Drupal 8 actually, and not only having 7 as the only theme we have. Um, if you want to read a little bit more of that on my blog, I put in uh, this, this post on Monday, where it's at, um, on my site, more than DK. Well, and actually, one more last thing, second last thing, one, uh, something. Um, I kind of joked about I wanted to help Dries with that theme thing. Um, what actually happened was, um, for the next 12 months, I'm gonna do one thing. 
Because um, <laughs> I got a sponsor for the next 12 months. So I can put in Contrib in TPL. I'm looking a lot forward to that. And it's kind of a dream. I got emotional over theme. <laughs> Motherfuckers. All right, so if you want to help out with this thing, the whole trick thing and how we're building stuff, join our, the Drupal Trick Slack. Uh, Drupal Trick dash Slack that Heroku app um, can automatically get signed up. We have about 400 people of us talking about these things. Frontend United in May in Greece is going to be goddamn amazing. If you do not know Smacks, Jonathan Snook is going to tell you all about it. That's actually where it's at. That's kind of one of the cornerstones we're building this stuff on. Um, so, my hour is done. I'm Morton Decay, the happy themer. Thank you all for showing up. It's pretty amazing. Um, so, the last thing, um, the slides is on tinyurl.com, 21 things, Dublin. The Flat Earth demo is on the same, same place. Um, where you can get it, Jesus Christ, I just need to like do this. Because I've never been presenting in such a big room. It's kind of crazy for me. Um, it's kind of a journey, actually. <sighs> feedback on this, tiny URL, 21 things, feedback. I do have some stickers and stuff uh, to hand out to people at some point. Come up, talk with me for this. So, because the next, the next year I'm going to build Drupal themes. It's going to be fucking amazing. Good. Thank you all for showing up. <laughs>